Hello, and on behalf of the Cyber Reason team, welcome to today's webinar discussing the cyber attack risk in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Thank you all for coming. My name is Sam Curry, and I'm joined today by our CEO and co-founder of Cyber Reason, Lior Div, and our CTO and another co-founder uh, of Cyber Reason, Yonatan Um, The session today is being recorded, and it will also be sent out in an email. So with that, I'd like to start maybe with a high-level question, Lior, for you. What are some of your overall thoughts on the Russia-Ukraine conflict and geopolitical implications before we dive into cyber? Uh, actually, we are uh, living right now in a fascinating uh, environment. <clears throat> I think that uh, this is the first time for many, many years in an unfortunate situation that we see a massive country like uh, Russia is actually in an act of war in another country, specifically the Ukraine right now. And this is uh, an opportunity for us to see how big uh, countries uh, behaving and using cyber as part of their ability to conduct warfare. Uh, needless to say that uh, it's a very sad situation right now, uh, but I believe that we learn uh, massively about the ability to use cyber in a warfare and the uh, role that cyber, as we know it today, taking part in the warfare and the agenda of uh, those big countries. Jonathan, anything that you would add about the geopolitical situation, uh, about what it's like both politically and economically in Russia, and maybe a little bit of the motivation behind the Ukraine conflict? So it, it's clear from, from at least from an outside observer perspective that the perception ahead of the war was of you know, pr Russia is a provable r superpower in cyber. We've seen it with everything from the DNC hack back before the 2016 election over here, many influence the, the uh, uh, information warfare being executed by the Russian government through the RIA and, uh, and the Internet, Russian Internet Agency. And in this conflict right now, cyber seems to be taking a relatively back seat in this environment. So it's fascinating to understand what are the drivers for this kind of behavior and you know put it differently what is the role of cyber within this conflict that's a fascinating question for us to explore today so let, let's let's dive into that a little bit and we'll zone in deeper and deeper we i think you've described it as an escalating scale of conflict in geopolitics that there's a first we do this and then it gets more serious and more serious on that escalating scale where does cyber show up and how yeah, it's fascinating to see that uh, in this case, uh, and I have to refer to what Jonathan said at the beginning, um, Russia was uh, perceived as a massive, basically, um, superpower when it's come to cyber. Th this is a country that uh, basically executed the NotPetya attack in 2017, uh, influence and election, as Jonathan said, uh, but most lately, we saw kind of the uh, solar wind attack, super sophisticated attack on the US government and the cartel of ransomware that's happening uh, in Russia, basically state ignored. Uh, with all of this knowledge that we collected through the years, uh, we were sure that the first thing that Russia will do is to leverage their capability in cyber in order to weaken uh, the Ukraine, making sure that they have a, a much more easier uh, 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 area to penetrate and then basically to start the act of war. The, the first uh, uh, assumption that we had before, it was that uh, the first attack going to be on a cellular network uh, in the Ukraine to basically take down the ability for the Ukraine uh, people to communicate internally and inside the army. And to be honest, at the beginning of the war, what we saw, we saw an attempt uh, to take down the satellite company uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, this is specifically the satellite company that control the command and control of the Ukraine army. Uh, but that was a fail attempt. Um, and a few days ago, in the 28th of March, uh, we saw another attack on the telecommunication, the national telecommunication, the mobile company in the Ukraine uh, that was down for probably a few hours and then uh, push back on the attack, manage to recover, and no damage or real damage has been done. So there is a conflict right now, uh, and something that we will need to dive into, kind of the gap between one hand, the superpower that we saw in the past that Russia represented when it's come to cyber, to the actual foot on the ground type of attack that we see in the Ukraine 
that they are super not successful right now. So um, we had first uh, uh, the R evil arrests. We've had Conti. Um, looks like it's been nationalized. Um, even even general increase in hacking activity that if not directly in the employee, at least aligned or maybe something shadowy is happening. What's the role of cybercrime in this? Maybe I'll ask first Jonathan, then Lior. What's the role of cybercrime in this? And, and is there a polarization happening or is this business as usual? So we've seen a couple of interesting phenomena. First, across both sides of the fence, cyber actors, especially on the, on the, on the, on the kind of non-organized part, are drafting themselves for the war. On the on the Russian side, we're seeing our evil, the arrested and effectively nationalized Conti and other groups are calling out and, and clearly aligning themselves with the the Russian government and the Russian uh, current operation and current war in the Ukraine. On the other side, from the West side, we're seeing everything from anonymous to other groups aligning themselves and saying we will use our powers in a non-organized, not nationally organized manner to go and inflict damages back on Russia. That goes with against companies in Russia and even companies in the Western world who have not, um, in their mind, gone sufficiently uh, <clears throat> sufficiently extreme in the way they disconnect themselves from Russia. We've seen attacks against other companies that were not perceived to be sufficiently aligning themselves in the side of the, you know, against Russia, uh, Russia front and, and are getting hacked by Anonymous and others saying this is punishment for not taking a more active stance in the, in the war. So definitely the broader cyber scene is being very, very active. It's being very active here. There's a second layer that's worth talking about, which is the role of cryptocurrency, which is in a, in a kind of adjacent field. Both the Ukraine and Russia have gone uh, extremely vocal and active in allowing and supporting cryptocurrencies as a payment method in order to overcome uh, cyber vulnerabilities and other, and of course, sanctions within the, the legacy banking system. And naturally, every time cyber currency gets involved here, an increased amount of hacking activity comes with it in order to try to attempt and subvert some of these transactions for other purposes. So there's definitely a lot of, uh, in the financial area, work on cyber as well as a, as well as a kind of private and criminal and then non-national organization working on both sides. But it does look very clear that Russia has been bringing a lot of the, uh, the private or the criminal hackers into the fold and working and aligning them across missions, objectives, and activities with the more uh, national government activity. And, and, and so the ruble devaluing, it looks like cryptocurrency is, if anything, more stable at this point or gaining in value because of its use. Lior, you mentioned attacking the cellular network and, and, and Jonathan just brought up uh, critical infrastructure. What's the splash effect here? What's the potential for it to go beyond the physical boundaries and into other areas, both digital and physical? Yeah, in order to understand it, we, we have to almost go back more than a year ago to understand what, what was the dynamic with Russia, uh, specifically with the US, and then to understand kind of how it's evolving as we speak right now. So if you go back more than a year ago, you can see that uh, once uh, President Biden was elected uh, and, and it was a switch uh, in the governments here in the US, so Trump uh, was not elected, President Biden was elected, and suddenly we saw a switch between a massive type of attack that's coming from China that's starting to be less uh, vocal. I'm not saying that the Chinese stop uh, attacking, but it become like less uh, prominent or less vocal. And we're starting to see the Russian type of attack or attack that's coming from Russia starting to be very, very active, specifically in two different uh, dimensions. One is the state-sponsored uh, one, the one that uh, um, specifically going after espionage and kind of the most uh, prominent one was the solar wind attack um, that we saw here in the US. This, basically, this is the Russian government going after the US government in order to collect intel. Uh, but then we saw another f fascinating thing. Uh, this is a growing ransomware cartel in Russia, uh, starting to basically uh, become stronger and stronger. And we used to call it a uh, state ignored. And as Jonathan mentioned, the state ignored become now sta state control when Putin basically arrested the R evil group and recruited them. Um, this is two kind of dimension that the, the Russian were very, very active. 
But there is another one that uh, this is the influence campaign, the warfare of, of information that Russia basically managed to, to do in a very, very successful way in the election in 2016 and the election in 2020. Basically, this is the capability to influence what people think and making sure that they're choosing the, the um, candidate that Russia wants to president or any other thing. So if you think about Russia, they were operating in the state uh, sponsored, in the state ignored that becomes state controlled and the information warfare, that that's kind of the third uh, capability that Russia presented the, uh, during kind of uh, the past few years. Now to your question, when you go forward, it's fascinating to see that in the warfare on information, right now the Ukraine people are uh, basically have the upper hand and they are the one that controlling the narrative. While uh, in the past, Russia showed that they have this capability they're unable to execute it when it's come to a real war. And this is true to the state uh, ignored and to the state controlled and to basically state sponsored uh, attack that they are not uh, successfully executing. So we are in a fascinating point in time that right now it's look like Russia is losing the battle. Um, but I will not uh, be rushed to say that Russia don't have those capability. So our assumption right now in cyber reason is that we're going to see a bounce back specifically from the ransomware cartel and specifically when the sanction on Russia becomes stronger and stronger and Russia need to do something and that will be kind of almost the easy button for them to push and to let go all those groups that they are recruited to start doing a massive type of ransomware attack specifically on the US to create a pressure on the economy here in the US. So this is interesting. So we've got uh, on the ground, we've got foreign fighters and a foreign legion for the Ukraine. And now we've got a Ukraine IT army. We've got nationalization of resources in Russia in the cybercrime community. Um, in the escalation of this, uh, my first question to either of you is what, what do we have to worry about outside of these countries with this militarization of the Internet? Who should be worried? What organizations and what sorts of things should they be worried about? Or is that knowable at this point? Yeah, I'm not sure that right now we actually know, but I think that we can learn from the past and assess what will be in the future. Uh, for example, I'm pretty sure that after uh, the situation that we have right now, it's going to be a, a debrief inside Russia, in, in the government, to assess basically what was successful and what wasn't successful. I think that the, there is a lot of lesson learned that they are going to uh, basically conclude it. And I'm pretty sure that what we are going to see, we're going to see a massive investment in cyber because this is something that will give them the ability to, to become a superpower. Uh, I think that they were very, very successful, unfortunately, with the ransomware cartel that uh, was uh, basically a private cartel. It was not uh, sponsored by the government. Uh, but now when the government will have control on this cartel, they have massive amount of capability to create an uh, attack, a uh, very sophisticated attack. So I, I don't think that this is kind of the last inning of, of this uh, play, that this is just the beginning. No, I hear you. Um, Jonathan, um, well, yeah, I would I would go like ahead. Add, I would like to add, there's a couple of interesting firsts in this war and a couple of interesting things we can learn pre-war that may or may not become something that is part of the future operation of military conduct. Conduct. We're saying, as Lior said earlier, from an information warfare perspective, it's fascinating. Russia was by far one of the strongest influencer using um, in carrying out information warfare across the entire Western world and appear to be not successfully doing so right now. However, We've had for the first time, for example, militarization of AI in the form of deep fakes of the President Zelensky, a, a fake of President Zelensky claiming uh, uh, he's giving up and the war should be abandoned and, and, and the Ukrainians should escape. Clearly a fake attempt by, sorry, by the Russians to dissuade the, the local fighters on the ground. We're seeing uh, telecommunication not being disrupted by cyber, but definitely you know, when missiles hit infrastructure, it has a similar effect. Let's not forget, the war started, we've had a couple of wiper attacks, the, the hermetic wipers and others were destructive malware attempting to bring down system. These by and large failed to get reaction, but they're not very dissimilar from NotPetya, who was a very successful campaign that actually spilled from the Ukraine 
really globally and, and causes billions of dollars of damages as well as loss of lives and, and other horrible and horrendous operation. This is not a very dissimilar activity. However, this time it did not succeed, unlike, unlike the NotPetya campaign. There's definitely a lot of firsts here. And I'm, as Lior said, I'm pretty sure that post hoc, a lot of strategists across Americas, across the world will ask themselves, what is the better way to utilize cyber to sow confusion and doubt in the world? So I, I think, you know, if we, if we paraphrase, if, if, we, if we try, if we were to postulate that when the cannons are heard, the hackers are silent, I don't think that's the case. I think we're still in the point where we're reevaluating and constantly assessing how, how are things changing. However, we do know that the rate of change and the develop, rate of development of assets in cyber versus in wartime are not necessarily compatible. So there's a question of how to better align the success and abilities of the cyber realm with those of legacy on the ground warfare. To, to give an example of uh, how hackers are evolving, and this is something that uh, for us was uh, fascinating. Um, you can go back all, to, all the way to NotPetya in 2017. Uh, back then, uh, NotPetya was spreading all over the world. Uh, Cyber Reason was the company that uh, we were the one that found the kill switch uh, to find a way to stop it. Uh, when we reverse engineer it, we knew that this is a government act. We managed to find the kill switch. We released it uh, first over Twitter, then basically CNN caught it and starting to spread the word. And using those uh, two communication methods, we managed to stop the spread of NotPetya. Um, then, as a company, we sent a team to the Ukraine to help the cybersecurity police over there uh, in order to do a full investigation. And what we discovered uh, with others, that we're not talking about ransomware attack. We're talking about basically the Russian trying to disguise a failed espionage operation by en encrypting all the computer that their uh, malware and their payload was installed. So th that was the story about uh, NotPetya. But then what you see, you see the uh, evolution of those attackers uh, all the way to 2020 when SolarWind was hitting here in the US. If you reverse engineer the code and the payload of uh, SolarWind, what you, what you will find there, you will find that uh, those hackers basically uh, check if cyberism is installed on the machine. And if we were installed on the machine, basically they decided not to hack because they knew that we will be able to uh, find them. So in this demonstration, what you see, you see an attacker that got hit once by a, a private company that basically managed to discover them and evolve and learn to basically deciding not to attack if we're there. Um, in order to avoid the fact that we will discover them because their main goal was to go after the U.S. government and specifically parts of the U.S. government. So this learning and evolution of uh, cyber capability, this is something that I believe that we're going to keep seeing in the near future. And as Jonathan said, it's uh, the e evolution of how the Russian government will use cyber and not just them, the Chinese, the Iranian and the rest of the world. Uh, this is uh, something that many, many countries are going to learn deeply and evolve, uh, you know, in the near future. So this is um, let the victim go and save the campaign because the tools on the ground could actually stop it. But we do know they have more sophisticated tools. And, and touching on something, some things both of you have said, uh, I'd, I'd put this question up to either of you. Are they a cyber superpower? Does even such a thing exist in your opinion? I think and that where, is, where are those weapons, right? I mean, we, they haven't all appeared yet. Yeah. So I, I think that we saw Russia executing uh, in the past sophisticated cyber attack. SolarWind, as we mentioned earlier, it was super, super sophisticated a supply chain attack. This is not something that uh, if you don't have capability of cyber, you you, you know you you cannot execute basically. Um, I think that the, the question that we have to answer here is, was it just a pinpoint, a, a single effort attack, uh, solar wind, or the election? Or this is something that the Russian can execute in a very methodical way and just to push the button when they want. Right now, we saw that when they're pushing the button, specifically, for example, when they wanted to take down the solar network in the Ukraine, they failed to do that. Um, so right now, th there is a gap between one hand, very sophisticated type of attack that we're seeing, 
and to the other end that when they are actually need those type of attack to give them uh, the upper hand in a warfare they fail to use them so this gap this is something that it's very very hard to explain right now and if i need to guess this is kind of a fail of execution as we saw by the way in the real attack that they fail to execute when it's come to operational, when it's come to supply food and, and fuel to their uh, teams uh, on the ground. And I believe that the same kind of type of problem we see kind of affect the cyber realm. Yeah, I, like what Leo said. Uh, I think the answer is a clear yes. Russia is a cyber superpower. Just in the Ukraine itself is, is an arena. We've seen the Russians take down the power, the power in 2015, 2016, we've seen the attack near Petya disrupting the economy and spilling over globally. We've seen, you know, just recently the, the Wipers trying to attack there, successfully taking down via, via SAT and then Ukraine Telecom a couple of hours, but it doesn't appear to be a strategic tool in their arsenal right now. And I, and I agree with Lior, I think it's a, a, a failure to execute and a failure to plan on how to better integrate this tool Within the the within over, overall kinetic warfare, which which causes them uh, again, there's a time horizon question. How fast do you convert an intention to an execution if you had not planned ahead in time for it? it I believe that it's not it's not a issue of capability. It's an issue of decision on how is how, what is the better way to leverage and combine these two tool sets together. But another thing we should look at from a cyber perspective, Russia has been the go-to. Um, the go-to um, perpetrator, the one you actually defend against, the go-to attack simulation. M MITRE attack just recently, just yesterday, published the last evaluation round where the reference threat was, on top of criminals, a nation-state-backed GRU unit going after infrastructure. So, And that's been the third time we're using Russian operators' attack as a simulator and the reference attacker into which we are, we're protecting against. So on the defender side, all of us, and there's a reason why Cyber Reason came as the top contender of MITRE, of the MITRE evaluation, is because we're using the Russian capabilities as the reference on to, for which we measure ourselves and protect against. So definitely on the defensive side, we've also massively increased our capabilities to fight and stop the, the Russian activists right now, which might also explain why it's not being utilized to the, the, to the full effect right now in the Ukraine. So we've yeah, got, but, yeah, go ahead, Leo. Yeah, if you take what Jonathan just said about kind of uh, the gap between intention uh, to the time that you can execute uh, in cyber, and this is something that uh, most people don't know, you, you cannot just push the button. Uh, basically, if you didn't um, plan in advance and you didn't uh, create it kind of the right tooling in advance and, and um, penetrate, install them in a dormant way, you cannot just push the button. And it looked like uh, Russia did not plan in advance to take down the Ukraine, because if they did and they had like a year or two in advance, you would expect that they have the red button, that they can just push and take down the satellite communication, they can push and take down the cellular network, and so on and so forth. And right now it's not look like they have those buttons that they can push and execute. So now the time between planning and, and wanting to do something to actually do it, in cyber, it's not immediately, it's, it never was immediate. Uh, at least it's take a few months to plan uh, till you can actually execute these type of attacks. So we've got two different approaches here. Um, the US is doing open source intelligence and it would appear to be anything but in Russia. So these two, these two poles are treating things very differently. In the middle, the Ukraine has seemed to have a masterful command of social media. We've talked about critical infrastructure, we've talked about attacks on systems. To what degree is the propaganda war being won or lost? And what is Russia's capability in that, do you think? We're, 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 from a Western perspective, we're clearly feeling that the Ukraine is winning. The, the Ukrainian narrative rules the dome completely in the, you know, in the streets here in the States, but also throughout most of the Western world. If you, on contrast, discuss uh, and views and opinions of, of Russian population on the ground, the majority of them are still convinced of the government's um, legitimate behavior. However, it's a very, very complex conflict. Definitely here in the West, it seems that the Ukraine worldview is controlling. Again, it has a very natural bias. We, we've been thinking of Russia and the Russian expansionists as a threat for many years. It has subsided since the fall of the Soviet Union, but never quite completely disappeared. 
but it's, it wasn't too many years ago where when you know when Mitt, Mitt Romney said enem, the enemy of reference is Russia and people have called him you know obsolete and irrelevant and stuck in, in in the past, which is clearly these days no longer the case because we're as we're seeing on the ground. So there's definitely an evolution here. As Lior said earlier, in the past multiple years, we're seeing a lot of success of Russian propaganda influencing. Influence campaign both here in the States and across Europe has been successful in changing election results or influencing election results, has been successful in controlling the narrative, has been successful in sowing more uh, dissent across Western countries. So Russia does have capabilities across this. But I think it goes back to the question of what they, th they thought would happen, and what would be the role of information warfare. Once again, the time horizons here matter dramatically. These things cannot be pushed so aggressively as they become obvious. So we have seen some attempts in the, show, the form of uh, deep fakes and, and using those things. There's definitely information warfare happening, but by and large, the, the Ukrainian machine is working much better, or succeeding much better in the Western world than, than the, Russian, the Russian one. Yeah, if you think about it, then it's, uh, again, super fascinating to look at it. Russia have, for sure, the capability to do and conduct uh, information <laughs> warfare. Election 2016, election 2020, they were dominating basically every social media and execute in a way that actually influenced uh, the minds of many, many people around the world. So the question is, is Russia had this capability? The answer is absolutely yes. But it's looked like that if they are not planning in advance, um, they cannot just go on a guerrilla information warfare. And this is something that uh, I'm giving a lot of respect to the Ukraine and specifically uh, the prime minister there, Zelensky, uh, that they understand immediately when the, this warfare uh, started that have to do a guerrilla uh, information warfare and basically leveraging and using everything that they have. So they didn't probably plan in advance. It was a surprise for them. But once uh, the, the situation started, instead of planning and starting uh, trying to execute in a very methodical way, they started basically to use every tool and every uh, uh, power that they have. Basically, they use a basic, think about it, a mobile phone. And the president, uh, he got kind of a picture of himself and starting to distribute massive information through every uh, uh, social media and every capability that he has in order to speak with his people, with the world, and with everybody. So this is fascinating to see that Russia could not just execute the guerrilla information warfare. And it's looked like that if they didn't plan in advance to actually do it, they failed to execute um, you know, in a very fast manner. And I think that this is something that is very important uh, to understand because this is gave the Ukraine the ability to control the narrative in a very fast way. And you know, maybe there is a new term here, guerrilla information warfare that you know we, we can borrow from the real type of warfare that's happening. It's almost cyber citizen soldiers as well, this guerrilla warfare. Um, controlling that narrative led to hacktivism. It led to Anonymous and Squad 303 doing things like robo-dialing and actually getting people to call. Do you think that mobilizing the neutrals and the citizen soldiers, getting the guerrilla information warfare going at grassroots, is that a big factor here and a lesson learned for Russia and the world? I, I think that it's uh, contribute massively to the way that people think. And I think that uh, we should not, um, you know, it, it, information warfare, this is uh, probably kind of an influence campaign. Uh, this is probably the new uh, frontier when it comes to cyber, because you control eventually or you direct what people will do and i think that what uh zelensky managed to do he managed to convince the western world while he's not part of nato while he's not part of uh you know the 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 union between the western countries and basically they said almost no to him to be part of it but they sent him weapon money uh he managed to recruit many people to support them in the cyber world, in the physical world. So I think that uh, we have to take very, very seriously when it's come to information warfare and the power that it has. Uh, sometimes it looks like that it's less uh, than a regular cyber because there is not uh, an attack that it's specific attack. But the long-term effect of information warfare 
this is something that it's uh, helping the Ukraine uh, uh, war right now as we speak by shaping basically the minds of what people think about it uh, in the Western world uh, in general. As you've been speaking, Lior, I realized this kind of influence and narrative control would have been impossible 30 years ago or even 20 years ago. It's a very Absolutely. different kind of, we talk at Cyber Reason about reversing the hacker advantage, uh, right? And but but honestly, it looks like cyber may have reversed the kinetic fight advantage to some extent here. Um, Lior, um, and you know, so I'm going to ask each of you one last question as we approach the end of our time, and it's an open one. Uh, I'll start with you, Jonathan. Um, what, any final thoughts about this conflict? It's gone on longer than I think anybody, East or West, uh, private sector or government, had thought it would. Any thoughts on the, the future direction of the conflict and what you think some of the, the changes in strategies might look like? So I, I think the, even the question itself started with one of the biggest issues of failing to understand and failing to plan. And maybe part of the reason why cyber did not take a more massive part here. It, it seems apparent that the Russians believe this will be a very, very quick war. And therefore, from because of the, the time horizon for information warfare and cyber attacks to, take, to make an impact is longer, they did not plan on this becoming a strategic component of this. But that failed to plan, failing to plan, the failure to execute is kind of a, a corollary of the situation. So there's definitely here a, a dramatically shift on the ground from what the Russians appear to have thought would happen versus what actually happens. Now, no doubt Russia is and remains a superpower. It seems that right now a lot of the information warfare capabilities are, are directed inside. The amount of censorship happening right now and information control within Russia to control the population thinking of the war and garnish support internally is dramatic. The, the, the um, data that the average Russian citizen is exposed to right now is dramatically and vastly skewed by the government's control. And here in the West, on the other hand, we are bombarded and, and in, in a very effective manner with messaging supporting the Ukrainians out of the conflict. Again, it's an it's a easier sell to, to many degrees. But that massive amount of support is what also pushes the political layer to go and be willing to expand more, to invest more in this conflict. So we're definitely seeing how information warfare, even ahead of time, can be a vastly useful tool in order to, to, to impact uh, the war afterwards, which was not used successfully in this case. So it's going to be a fascinating learning period as a result of this conflict. Lior, any thoughts from you on this? Yeah, I think that uh, what we see, we see something that, uh, from my point of view, is super fascinating is as technology evolves, and right now technology has evolved very, very fast, the use of technology and the ability to use this technology to your advantage, this is something that was not exist in the past. In the past, the war were defined by how many planes, tanks, and soldiers you have. And that's it, basically. And it's, it was almost a matter of uh, you know size and strength uh, and planning and executing. What you see right now that the Ukraine uh, and in Ukraine is happening is that you can leverage new technologies and you can use them very, very fast if you're nimble. And even if you didn't plan in advance, you can use it to your advantage and you can change many things that's happening. One example that we gave is the uh, guerrilla information warfare. Uh, but there is many technologies that the Ukraine uh, right now is using in order basically to take down uh, Russia. Uh, one of the examples is to find out where is those generals and to take them down using cellular network. Um, and this is something that uh, we saw in the past uh, few days. And it's fascinating to see how technology influence cyber. If you know how to use it fast, um, you, you can win wars. Uh, it's very you know, early to determine what will be the end of this conflict. And it's very sad right now. Uh, but I believe that if we look at the future, cyber and information will take a significant and growing basically portion of this type of, uh, of a conflict that we'll see in, in the future. So prior to this uh, conflict, there was a debate even whether cyber war existed. And coming into this discussion, I thought the main topic of conversation would be when will the other cyber shoe fall? Instead, what I'm hearing from both of you, and my takeaway, and I, and I believe the audience will have heard this too, is cyber has had an unexpected and dramatic influence on geopolitical conflict. Um, we're at the end of our time. I do want to thank you both for your insight, and I found it very enlightening. 
Lior, thank you. Jonathan, thank you. And for our audience, that's a wrap for today's session. We'll be sending out the recording in an email. And thank you again from the whole Cyber Reason team for attending today's session and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you very much for having us, Sam. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, guys.